All right, I'll share my screen, shall I? Yeah. All right. And we'll do that one right there. Yep. Cool. Happy days. Well, thanks so much, Fred. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining me today uh, on this beautiful day. I'm, I'm uh, on the Gold Coast here in Australia. Um, originally an American, um, but uh, I live here in Australia now. And we'll be talking today about um, the supply chain, the software supply chain, and um, uh, hacking it one developer at a time, which I which I know is a is a uh, got some hyperbole there, but I believe it's. <clears throat> Malicious actors and threat actors, I, I believe it's, it's the most um, successful way for them, unfortunately, to attack the software supply chains. So without further ado, um, I, like Fred, I won't bore you with my whole background, but I've had a long career um, uh, starting in the 90s, the early 90s. Um, I've worked for large organizations. I've worked for government. I've worked for government both in Australia and in the US. Um, I've worked in, in, for startups as well as large enterprise companies. Um, and the interesting thing is that that I see the same kind of issues um, <clears throat> at both large and small organizations, um, which is that the software engineers are typically the softest um, or most attackable part of an organization's software supply chain. And that's why I wrote today's um, presentation, which I've given in, in several forms um, over the years. Um, I have been in application security and, and cloud native application security for a long, long time. Um, and uh, most of my, the last 15 years or so has been spent kind of in, in application platforms, uh, building and, and securing applications at scale. I've done that, like I said, for both large and, and small organizations. Um, so some of the projects that I currently work on um, um, I occasionally do some stuff with the Cyclone DX SBOM project for any SBOM fans out there. I'm, I'm a big fan of SBOMs, uh, but I've also been part of the MBSP, the Minimal Viable Secure Product um, project, which was say um, it's a it's a kind of sponsored and collaborated on by a number of large organizations, including Google and Salesforce and others, but. Um, a lot of uh, security startups are involved as well, including mine, uh, SecureStack. Oh, and by the way, I should say that uh, ahead of time, I, I'm the founder and CEO of SecureStack. Um, SecureStack is a, a company founded here in Australia that helps organizations build and deploy more secure applications. We do that by scanning your source code, your cloud stack, and your, um, your web assets. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about uh, the software supply chain. Um, and so some of the key takeaways um, that I would like us to learn and, and take away from today's talk um, is that the software supply chain is a lot broader than what I think most people believe. Um, what I, when I ask people often, you know, define for me what you believe is in the software supply chain, they'll say, ah, uh, I don't know, maybe my open source libraries. Um, and I think that's a very common kind of misconception. Um, so part of this talk today is to, to help the audience understand that the, the software supply chain is broader than just your open source libraries. Um, another takeaway is that what are some of the common attack vectors that bad guys, malicious actors will use against your software supply chain? Um, and how do you defend against those attacks? And this is particularly powerful for the, the software engineers that work for all of us um, because they typically don't employ a lot of security controls. Um, so that brings us to the last takeaway, which is what tools and resources can we use to defend ourselves against these attack vectors um, in the software supply chain? So those are today's takeaways. Now, I was just talking a second ago about the common misconceptions about software supply chain and how it's often misconstrued as just essentially a package manifest for your um, 
application, which only includes, by the way, you know, the open source or other packages that you have specifically calling out, or it doesn't include um, a lot of the, the, the rest of the, the application. So let's, let's look at what Wikipedia has to say about a supply chain in general. So this is not a software supply chain. This is just supply chains. A supply chain is a complex logistics system that consists of facilities that convert raw materials into finished products and distribute them to end customers or consumers. Now, I think that last part is really, really important. A software supply chain delivers functionality and use and value to people that pay for it, consumers and, and the customers. So a supply chain only works if it's delivering value for its customers. For example, a supply chain for the automobile industry, if it builds cars and trucks that no one wants, it's not very successful, is it? So we have to think about that in, in, in that, that kind of way. So the way I like to think about the software supply chain, this is my own definition, I like to say that a software supply chain is anything that is needed to deliver a functioning application to customers. So anything that needs to go into the build, excuse me, the process with which you create that application that then brings value to your customers. Let's look at one kind of, you know, this is, this is my caricature of a software supply chain for a particular application. I live in Australia and my gov is the way that Australians interact with um, social services as well as the tax system here in Australia. It's basically one portal that connects to a bunch of different things, including um, uh, your tax, both for personal and company, um, uh, for your, uh, if you're getting any subsidies, for school or anything, uh, uh, it's our it's our welfare system too as well. So everybody uses it because you have to use it for taxes, but also delivers a lot of other services as well. So it's a complex application. Now, as we kind of break apart that supply chain, if we think about all the things that need to go into it to make it work, you can think about the things like in the lower left-hand corner, the, the software and the libraries and the programming languages there, I have Java and JavaScript and TypeScript. Well, that, that, those, that source code is stored somewhere. In this case, it's stored in GitHub. If you don't have access to GitHub and you can't actually deploy that application, you don't have a functioning supply chain. Similarly, that source code needs to be deployed somewhere. And it typically will use things like CDNs and cloud providers to be deployed. If the MyGov application isn't deployed into AWS or Azure or wherever else it's deployed to, is it delivering value to the customers? No, it's not. Similarly, it's down there in the, in the bottom, you have Matt, one of my friends that, that works for the government and delivers MyGov, right? If he doesn't write the application, if he doesn't know how to deploy it, then the application can't exist. Again, he's part of the software supply chain. Finally, MyGov uses the Adobe Experience Manager CMS, Content Management System. Right? That's what puts the application dynamically together. It also consumes several APIs. Um, I only list two here, but it consumes more than this. It consumes the Services Australia API for that kind of data from the government. It also consumes ATO or tax information from the, the Australian Tax Authority. If, if all those things aren't there, it can't actually produce anything, right? It's not providing value to customers. So. It, you know, I went to do some business reporting the other day at, at MyGov and it said, hey, this service is temporarily unavailable. And they're, they're, they're undergoing some scheduled, under, it said scheduled, it wasn't scheduled. It was the middle of the afternoon on a Thursday or something, right? But then when I, when I kind of inquired, I found out that it was because the APIs weren't working. And so I wasn't able to deliver what I needed which was access to my tax info for, for my business. So in that case, the rest of the application is working, but some of the data isn't. So again, this is how broad the supply chain is for the application. This application was not delivering its primary value, which was to help me do my tax information because of an API.
Now, why do we have to understand that this software supply chain is more complex? Well, it's because the applications we're building are more complex. And this is a super important thing that I want us to take away today. The applications that our software engineering teams are building today globally are more complex, materially more complex than they were even a few years ago. And that's for kind of three high level reasons. The first reason is that the programming languages that we're using and the frameworks we're using are different. Many of them use, say, JavaScript, which is a client-side language. It runs in your browser. So when your browser is interacting, interacting with your tax data, it's not like before when with a, with a kind of classic three-tiered application that my browser talks to you know, a, a web server, which then talks to an application server, then then talks to a database. All of that happens behind a DMZ, right? That's not the case anymore. Our browsers are often talking directly to the services that the application consumes to give value to the customer. That's a very important observation to make. JavaScript has changed the attack surface of our applications. Second, these applications we're building now are running on new infrastructure, things like Kubernetes and containers, serverless, and all the other kind of new and fancy things that Lambda and AWS. Each of these new kind of bits comes with its own set of challenges, including access and network and relationship dependency. And so that too then is part of your, uh, your supply chain. If those infrastructure bits have dependencies and relationships to other things, then that's something that you have to be tracking. And finally, cloud native applications are consuming data directly and services directly from the public cloud providers. Um, so, and I think this is something that is often lost for people that aren't, you know, building these applications on a day-to-day -day basis, but many applications are consuming things like Cognito, which is an identity IDP, right? It's an identity, um, uh, centralized identity service from AWS. That service is public. It is, it is then adding stuff to DynamoDB, sorry, DynamoDB, which is a, uh, a NoSQL database in, in AWS. That too is a public uh, endpoint. So these cloud native applications, because we have to interact with them in a different way than we used to interact in the data center, the number of public attack points, and these are public facing URLs or URIs, the number has gone up dramatically. So 10 years ago, there was an average of one or two public endpoints for an application, right? Typically the web app, perhaps an API that was exposed to the public. Now, some of the cloud native applications that we, we look at have more than 30 public assets, Cognito, AppSync, DynamoDB, RDS, and all these other things, right? So that comes with its own challenges as well. So all of this was in my head and I was thinking, I need to better represent this for my customers. And, and so what I did is I came up with a project called the Visualizing Software Supply Chain Project. And here it is in front of you. It's 10 steps that kind of move from left to right, um, including to the far left where things start at the people, the software engineers and the QA teams and the DevOps teams that are building and deploying these applications. It is then the next stage is, is the IDE the, the source code versioning software like Git that, that the developer is using on their local laptop or their local environment. It's local tests that are required by those applications to, to, to pass before the application can be deployed to SCM. Next, the next stage is source code. This is the actual code that developers are building and writing, right? And the dependencies inside of the source code stage are the languages, the frameworks, libraries, the open source and the proprietary code that your software engineers are building. Next is the integration stage. This is where all of your developers, the code that they're writing, goes together and is integrated together to become one centralized code base. Inside of the integration stage, we have issues like shared Git repositories and source code management providers like GitLab and GitHub and so on and so forth. We have pull providers. All of those things are needed to be able to deploy and create a new application. Just like when you're building automobiles on Henry Ford's famous assembly line, 
if you didn't have the nuts for the for the bolts that went on the wheel, the whole assembly line stops. And we have to think about the way we build applications in the same way. If each one of those things isn't there and isn't secure, then the whole thing stops. Next is the deployment phase. So now that you've taken all the source code together, you've run some tests on it, let's actually deploy it somewhere so we can interact with it. So the deployment phase, there's multiple kind of sub-dependencies or sub-components, the build solutions that you're using. These might be build servers, right, for example. The deployment platforms they're using, things like maybe Fly IO and other, other kind of ways to deploy services quickly to, to test them. There's then the functional test where somebody's actually interacting with this thing you just deployed. And the security test is the thing I just deployed. Is that secure, right? Is, are there any indirect, um, insecure direct object references and other, other kind of things in it? Next is the runtime stage. Now runtime is where we draw together those components to actually make the application run once it's been deployed. So sometimes you deploy those to servers, right? Uh, and sometimes the, the, those servers have, well, often those servers have operating systems. If the operating system is delivering packages to that server, the operating system and its package manager are also part of the dependency structure at the runtime level. Same thing for the web servers, app servers, the web engines like V8, uh, Node, and, and the databases that are used during runtime. The next stage is hardware. So the hardware stage is, does the application when it needs to be deployed, does it require any special hardware? And I think the most common example of that nowadays is GPUs. If your application does some sort of machine learning or AI, it's probably going to require a GPU, right? Uh, but there's also other examples, things like USB dongles and special PCBs, special little computer boards and whatnot. And this is particularly true for kind of IoT and embedded devices. Next, and this is, this is one that sometimes strikes people odd until we talk about it, but the, the next stage of the software supply chain is DNS. Your customer has to interact with that. Remember the application that I talked about, the MyGov application? People have to interact with that via a URL, and that URL relies on a DNS entry that we can all get to and all resolves as roughly the same thing. If it resolves as, if it resolves as something different for Fred than it does for Paul, perhaps that's a problem. Often it can be. So DNS is absolutely one of those requirements. Um, you can think about this more simply as like, if your prod is, you know, example.com, you know, right? And the dev version of that is dev.example.com and the staging version that's staging.example.com. All those things are very important to that kind of staged process of how you build your application. Next, and we're, we're down to the last two. Next is services. Services are those kind of third party dependencies that an application needs. In my earlier example of my gov, I pointed out that I want to use it and the API to the tax office wasn't working, right? Well, that's that's something that would be in this stage, those third party APIs. Maybe it's a SaaS solution. Maybe you're pulling from Stripe, right? If you're selling and you're you know, trying to deliver value to your customers, you wanna sell in your SaaS platform, well, Stripe or Braintree or whatever you're using for payments, that's pretty important. That's pretty important, especially when you're trying to deliver value to customers, right? Which is something that we said is important from the software supply chain perspective. Next, things like identity providers and, and other payment gateways. These are all things that need to be there that you're consuming from a third party. And that brings us to the last stage today, which is the cloud providers, right? And you can think about this as private, public cloud. It doesn't really matter. This is a part of the software supply chain where Maybe you've deployed to the cloud or maybe you're using cloud services as part of the application. In my earlier example, I mentioned Cognito. Your application doesn't have to be deployed in AWS to be using Cognito. It helps and they typically are, but those are two different things, right? So your IDP, if you're consuming that from, from you know, AWS or your database or whatever it is, that's absolutely a part of putting that application together. If that's not there, then you don't have an application. So those are the 10 stages of the software supply chain. Um, and you can find that in my visualizing software supply chain project on GitHub, which I'll show you later on. But let's move, move on now. Why is this so important? This is so important because something has happened over the last few years, which is that the bad guys have realized that the software supply chain and those components that I just talked about, especially software engineers, are 
the softest, easiest target, right? And so the attacks on the software supply chain, unfortunately, have dramatically increased over just the last few years. So they've gone up um, by over 700% year on year since 2019. Think about that for a second. 740 plus percent year on year. And I can tell you, I don't need this chart to tell me this. I see this in our customers and I see this with uh, what's happening out in the real world. I'm, I'm seeing that there are new attacks, which we'll talk about here in a second, which did not exist two years ago. In some cases they didn't exist a year ago. So why are software engineers the, the kind of the target for today's talk? Well, let's talk about the behaviors of software engineers and some of the other people involved. These are humans involved in the software supply chain. The, the description of a behavior is a trait of an individual human that makes that person less secure. So these are behaviors that humans exhibit that make them less secure. Let's talk first about software engineers, which I will call devs. Uh, I will use those words interchangeably because like Fred, I'm, I'm, I'm older and, and I'm used to saying devs. 70% oh, of devs um, <laughs> build resources in the cloud themselves. They couldn't do that in the data center because there were strict controls around that. But then when we all migrated to the cloud, many organizations did not have, did not migrate the same set of services. So instead, oftentimes software engineers or the DevOps teams have direct access to the cloud. They can spin up anything they want. And we see that just in the sheer sprawl that is happening in public cloud providers. These devs also like to use SAML and SSO, um, things like Auth0, for example, you know, or Cognito, um, because it's fast and it's simple. They implement it once and it just works everywhere, right? Well, that comes with some challenges that we'll talk about later on. They, these developers, they often use the business as an excuse to get stuff done that they want, right? They say, oh, the business wants it to be delivered by the end of the week, so I can't do that security thing, right? Or the business wants there to be no MFA because they don't want any resistance. They, they want customers to be able to create an account as easily as possible, right? So software engineers, and by the way, they often rightly will say these things, like the business really does say those things to them, but it's still, you know, it's still a point that I want to call out here that this ability for software engineers to blame things on the business means that often uh, the application itself and the software supply chain that builds that application are less secure. So these developers often don't refresh credentials because it breaks automation. Now, Bobby, in the talk before me, talked a bit about this. I didn't see his whole talk, but um, they often don't refresh credentials in places like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket because it will break automation. These keys are kind of buried inside of the application. They don't know where all they are. They don't know how the application is you know, authenticating with itself. You know, So in the absence of understanding it, they just create long lived keys. Um, and I don't see there being a move to, to short term, short lived keys, maybe as much as Bobby does. But at the same time, I think that that's absolutely something we should all be looking at um, via refresh tokens and, and other components. But anyhow, another talk. Um, they, these developers often use one account for multiple stages. So a behavior that we see quite often is that uh, a team will build something for dev and then they'll share that resource across staging and prod. And this means that if I tack it successfully in one place, I have access to it in all the other places. This is, this is very common, unfortunately, for databases, even in 2023, where it's too hard for the team to have a dev or staging database because it's too hard for them to replicate the database. So instead, what they'll do is they'll use a different table. Or in some cases, they use the same production data in dev and staging. Um, this is a very, very common behavior that we see. And finally, they don't return to address technical debt in their applications. And the reason for that is that the business incentivizes them not to do that, but instead to deliver features as quickly as possible, right? So they're not being incentivized to return to that debt. So what are some of the behaviors that leads, these are the software, the, the senior software engineers or the team leads, what are some of the behaviors that they will do that makes 
the software supply chain less secure? Well, they will act as a gateway for pull requests, right? They will they will get in between the decision making, and uh, they will they you know will change the standard. They'll enforce standards or methodologies across the team. They're supposed to, but then they will often abuse those elevated privileges in um, source code management. And we saw this with, for example, the SolarWinds talk, where the senior software engineers at SolarWinds were were bypassing um, the the uh, guidelines, the the guardrails that SolarWinds had in place for the regular engineers. They were bypassing that to do hot fixes and other things, and that was part of the problem. So. Some of the behaviors for management is that they don't really understand um, the, the whole software development process. And so because of that, um, they are often underrepresenting complexity to, for example, the C-suite. And so then the C-suite doesn't really understand how complex the software development processes, processes are. And that's a problem. I'm just kind of moving faster here. 70% um, of developers admit to skipping security due to delivery timelines. This is a problem. 48% of them admit to pushing code with known vulnerabilities. And 96% of, and actually this number is higher now, it's closer to 98% of cloud breaches are self-inflicted. We, we are causing the problem ourselves. So keep these statistics in mind. This is, we're moving fast and we have too much access and that's a problem. So what are the types of attacks that we're seeing in the wild? Well, I think we've all heard about, you know, kind of package-based attacks things like dependency confusion and account takeover. DNF poisoning is still, after 30, 40 years, is still a very, very viable attack vector. If I can tell you that npmjs.org is something different than what it's supposed to be, and then you then reach out to it to get your packages, you know, you do an NPMI, and your version of npmjs is not the right one, that's a pretty easy way for me to give you a malicious package, right? It's an oversimplification. But the point remains that DNS poisoning is still um, a very real thing. Exposed package manager credentials. This is a this is a growing problem. This gets back to how we build and deploy JavaScript applications. Quite often, when we do this, unfortunately, we deploy to prod a JavaScript app that actually has credentials, and in some cases, npm rc tokens and other things like that, inside of the app. And if you know how to look, you can find those things, and then you can gain access to. This is one of my favorite attack vectors when uh, we get involved with pen testing, um, that, that you know, finding these kind of uh, hidden uh, tokens um, is a very easy way for us to go directly to the crown jewels. And finally, the, the attacks on these package managers and, and the whole kind of ecosystem around packages, unfortunately, these attacks have now become automated and the bad guys have very powerful automation frameworks to leverage. Um, so if we take a look at my 10 stage software supply chain diagram, where on the software supply chain does the, the package kind of attack focus on? It, it focuses in the, in the source code stage, obviously, right? These are packages that are being drawn into source code that you need to be able to build the application. But also it's in things like the container registries that happen at deployment and even runtime, right? So attacks on a Docker Hub is, Docker Hub alone is one of the biggest, um, you know, issues that we have out there, and it's it's a huge issue, and people don't even realize how big it is. But anyhow, uh, some of the other attacks that we're seeing, um, there was there was a really at the heart of this PyPy attack was just really phishing, right? It was just really sending somebody an email. But here is what the bad guys did really well: is what happened is PyPy announced that they were going to make it mandatory for the 10% of their packages, the most popular 10% of their packages that those maintainers. So if I was maintaining a package that was very popular in PyPy, they were gonna force me to use, to validate my package so that I could then enable MFA. Well, the bad guys knew about this and they sent out a very, very convincing email to uh, people and you can find these email addresses really, really easily, right? We all use our email addresses to log into GitHub, for example, our work emails, right? So they sent a very, this phishing campaign was incredibly damaging. And at its heart, was just really good targeting. It targeted people on PyPy and it used a timely constraint. Um, so in this case, the attack happened in the first stage against people. So it actually, 
it, it, the attack really focused on the maintainers of these packages, right? And took advantage of the fact they knew they, they had heard that this change was coming. It was very timely, but also the package managers themselves in the source code stage. Now, one of my favorite attacks that didn't get a lot of publicity, but really should have is last year there were, um, uh, I, I woke up to see this, this tweet from Stephen Lacey where he had noticed 35,000 plus repositories that had, um, th th these are mostly forks of existing repositories, but there was also some other kind of, kind of components in there um, that uh, were fake, but also um, uh, were um, uh, delivering malware. Um, and GitHub was able to clean this up really easily because unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, the bad guys, you know, released this a little bit too soon and every single one of those repositories called the same URL. So all GitHub had to do is search through all these repositories and look for that. But if you look into this attack a little bit closer, it's, there's some really concerning issues here. One is that they targeted specifically um, uh, uh, packages and repositories and organizations that had name changes recently or had been called something else historically. They did a lot of really kind of crafty stuff that, that we didn't talk about. This is a very, very powerful attack that really foretold the fact that automation is coming for the bad guys. It's already here, and we're going to be dealing with this automation for years. Um, and there's just a little bit more information about that particular attack. This this particular attack happened uh, in the SCM provider and in the integration stage for the repository forks and, and how the SCM works, right? All right, so... JavaScript is, is a, a really serious concern for um, the software supply chain, just because people don't really understand the attack vectors and the attack surface for client side applications. Things like cross site scripting, which is just really easy to unfortunately be vulnerable to. Um, the exposure of those API keys and things I was talking about. The fact that nobody uses CSP content security policy, our data shows that a secure stack, we, we basically you know have have identified that less than 2% of content security policy globally is uh, is actually viable. I'm sorry, 2% of the applications that we've tested have viable um, content security policy. Um, and, and that's a real issue because one of the only ways to address kind of client-side attacks is content security policy. Um, SC, SSC, sorry, um, JavaScript, JavaScript attacks typically take place in the source code stage but also in runtime because it's actually running and you're, you know, it's loading in your browser. Um, and finally at the, at the, the cloud stage, because a lot of these attacks are actually taking advantage of um, people's not understanding how their CDN kind of components work. They're pulling in JavaScript from the CDN directly and that's built into a dependency structure that they don't understand. They can get delivered bad JavaScript that way. So what are the source, what are the kind of software supply chain attacks that we're seeing on developers? We're seeing the fact that developers typically are gonna use their work emails for their logins for uh, their GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and so on and so forth accounts, right? Well, it's really easy for me to figure out what their email address is, right? Because I can just go and look it up using Hunter and other techniques. It's really easy for me to go to LinkedIn and figure this stuff out. Very few software engineers are using SSH keys or MFA at the SCM layer. So that means that it's really easy for me to fish them because there's not gonna be that thing to capture that, right? If I send them a very well-crafted GitHub login screen, a lot of times that's all it takes to work, right? Um, and the, the, the fact that we're, we rely too much on SSO, right? A really good example of that is that many people don't realize when they use the, the Microsoft SSO layer that down in the bottom it says, what other login you know, options are there? You click that, it will often by default allow GitHub access. So all I got to do is go and create, you know, like a sock puppet on GitHub, just a, a throwaway account on GitHub. And I sometimes can log in, not always, but I sometimes can log into that service if they unfortunately have that ticked. Um, and fr frankly, the people maintaining these packages are prized targets and the bad guys know that. So they will specifically craft things like that PyPy email that you saw to attack those maintainers. And they will use social engineering very successfully to get access to these, um, these devs who oftentimes, frankly, as we saw earlier, 
have too much access to things like the cloud. And where does that, all of that is focused in that first stage, the software engineers themselves in the devs, that first stage. And frankly, if you can, if you can attack successfully that stage, um, maintaining and building persistence throughout the rest of the environment is much, much easier. So one of the things that we see people doing is that when they build something that relies on say GitHub, which is what you're looking at here, you're seeing a GitHub SSO imp implementation, they will create permissions that are far too permissive. They're giving away things that you shouldn't be giving, but your developers aren't really looking at that. They're just going grant access, grant access, grant access, right? And they perhaps have just given access if they have that access themselves to the whole GitHub organization, for example. This abuse of SSO is growing. We're seeing it grow dramatically at SecureStack. Uh, and this is a real problem because nobody's really talking about it, except me. So again, this attack is focused entirely on the developers in that first stage. You see a theme here, right? If we could attack the developers, um, it's, it's a very successful place to do that. So um, how can we defend against these attacks? And also conscious of time here. Some of my favorite resources are Oscar, which is the, um, the open source component um, attack reference, which is a great, um, uh, it's, it's built on GitHub. And what it is, it's an attack I'll show you really quickly here. I've got it open. It's an attack matrix, a MITRE attack matrix style um, uh, uh, project where it describes attacking the CI CD pipelines, starting first at reconnaissance, then moving into resource development, and so on and so forth, all the way to exfil and then impact at the far end of the life cycle. Each one of these things is something you can click on. So, dependency confusion, I talked about de dependency confusion. If you want to learn more, you can click on dependency confusion and you can learn more about that. And I'm one of the original collaborators. I haven't collaborated, I haven't added much in the last few months, but I'm one of the original collaborators on this project. Um, you can find this repository, it's called Oscar, but you can find it, its URL is pbomb.dev, which I think, yeah, pbomb.dev. If you go to that URL, it'll be a link to this, or you can just search on GitHub for um, uh, Oscar. Next is push securities SaaS attacks, which is great. It's again, it's like a, it's a MITRE style attack reference for, for attacks specific to the SaaS providers that we are all using. And that, I think I also have that open. Here's the GitHub repository for that. Again, just like the other kind of, you know, left to right matrices, which is great because that allows you to kind of build through the life cycle. You can see here the different reconnaissance vectors for SaaS specific attacks, initial access for SaaS specific attacks, execution, and through the life cycle. Um, I like this project a lot. It hasn't gotten a ton of visibility, but um, I really like reading through this. And again, these things are all clickable. You can use this to learn more about SaaS type attacks. If I click back over to our um, presentation today. Um, finally, the last one I want to talk about is something I wrote myself, which is called the DevSecOps Playbook. Uh, you can find that by just searching for GitHub, but it should also be down there. It's down there at the bottom of the screen. Um, <clears throat> the DevSecOps playbook is uh, about 60 different kind of tasks um, that a company or, or an organization can use to kind of address their overall software supply chain and application security. So it involves things. I've got it broken down into um, several different um, uh, domains. Uh, developers, source code, CI, CD, deployment, um, and organizational techniques, which is kind of the umbrella that sits over top of all of that. And then I also have an addendum for compliance. So if you look at this in particular, if you scroll down, for example, you can see that three commit hooks, this is something Bobby was talking about in the, in the talk before mine. Um, you can see here, you know, a little description about that. You can see some of the, the compliance frameworks out there that you know this um, uh, addresses or is mentioned in. The other thing I've done though, is I've actually prioritized each one of these things based on one, two, and three. One being the easiest, two being kind of middle difficulty, sorry, uh, 
uh, second most important. So number one is most important, sorry. Number two is um, next important. Num and three is the kind of the things that you should do last. And the way this is built is basically a company should take a look and do all the level one things they can. And then when they're done all that, they can kind of circle back and start doing the twos. And when they're done with all the twos, they can do the threes. In a similar way, I've also described difficulty for the different kind of um, suggestions or tasks that we have here. So for example, running local static code analysis on the developer's laptop, I would say this is probably not the first thing that you should do because it's harder for you to ask your, all your software engineers to do it. But it's definitely something that you should do. It should not be the last thing you do. So I've got its order as two out of three, right? I also say it's really easy because downloading SEMGREP takes all of 10 seconds and it will work like that. And you'll start getting value out of that. Um, and I've mapped that particular static analysis section to several frameworks here. And you can scroll through the whole project and you can see how I've broken those down into the different stages that roughly speaking map to those different stages of the software development life cycle and the software supply chain life cycle. So if I move back over to my presentation, how do all these projects that I just talked about, the Oscar project, the DevSecOps playbook and the SaaS attack, how do they stack up? We can see here, Oscar kind of maps to the first several stages of the software supply chain um, visualization. The DevSecOps playbook goes a little bit further. The SaaS attacks project from Push Security addresses the, the services kind of component. It's a very narrow focus, um, but I wanted something that was even bigger. And so I built this other project that I mentioned earlier called the Visualizing Software Supply Chain Project. Again, the address is at the bottom of the screen. I'll make these slides available to OWASP after this. Um, but this project is all about helping you understand these different stages of the um, life cycle. And if you go into this project, this is the GitHub repository, and you click on, for example, integration stage, this will take you to a drill on and you can kind of see who owns this stage, what are the security concerns for that stage, and how are some of the things that I can, what are some of the things that I can do to address security in that particular stage, right? And then if I wanna go and look at runtime, skipping ahead, same thing here. We, we talk about some of the, the individual components that are manifested in this stage, but then also who owns these things typically? So runtime is often owned by the operations team, for example. What are some of the software, sorry, what are some of the security concerns there? And then how, what are some of the ways that I can address that, right? And runtime, getting logging, for example, centralized logging out of something or intrusion detection, these are things that you can do in the runtime stage. So this was our project, the visualizing uh, software supply chain project. The point behind this was to build something that gave more breadth across that than, than the DevSecOps playbook or the PBOM, sorry, the Oscar project. Um, this is gonna give you visibility across the whole software supply chain. So I hope that you've enjoyed today's talk. Um, uh, the key takeaways again were, were, you know, the software supply chain is a lot more expansive than, it, than many people think about it uh, and definitely involves software engineers. And unfortunately those software engineers, um, in my experience, are the easiest place to attack on that software supply chain. If you gain access to them, everything else is relatively easy. What are some of the common attack vectors? We talked about those today briefly. If you want to learn more, um, again, this, this um, slide deck will be available um, via OWASP. But you can also check out some of those open source projects that I have talked about today. Um, and finally, what are those tools and resources? Go check out those open source projects that I, that I talked about today. Um, learn from them. Several of them talk about other projects. For example, the MBSP, which is something I'm involved in. Didn't specifically call that out at the end of the presentation there, but there's some great info there as well. All of this will be available um, uh, in these projects. And, and great timing. Here comes Fred. Uh, yeah, fantastic. This also was outstanding. Uh, we have about four minutes left. And uh, um, I just want to say that uh, you pointed out some some things I definitely didn't know. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of these topics, but some of those resources that you have, I've never seen and appreciate all of that uh, just for me. And I think this is a great uh, presentation right after Bobby's too. I liked 
um, how you pointed out that uh, software supply chain management isn't just thinking up about the bomb, the bill of materials, the the third party software that we use, because often in SMBs, it seems like, and maybe this is your experience too, that that's what they think of. If you want to think of software supply chain, they think of that, but you, you've you kind of, it sounds like, um, given it a more broad picture that this is not just the application and what's contained in the application, but there's more things. There's the cloud provider, there's uh, the uh, uh, services that you use inside your infrastructure that are protecting your uh, secrets and your software, et cetera. Um, and so I, I thought that was uh, pretty neat. Um, you, you also talked about uh, uh, container security, which is not talked about yet. And some of these attacks I thought were like PyPy, uh, dependency con confusion and, and things I think are still extremely relevant today. And uh, I don't know, I mean, are these easier to detect today? Do you do you find them easier to, to find? Is, is it just hoping that uh, GitHub or GitLab or wherever just finds it? What do you think about that? That's a great question because I've been thinking about a, a, a tool to fix exactly that. If I take a look at some, if I take a look at JavaScript package, you know, manifest files, right? I don't necessarily know which of those is private versus which of those is public. I can't look at the package manifest and know, and that is a problem. And then my my SCA tools won't tell me because all they're going to look up is the ones they can find at OSV and and NIST and CVD, right? Like so that knowing what is private what's not and then mm -hmm. because you can't tell the difference dependency confusion can exist at multiple levels there it is a big issue and i think because most people don't really understand how complex it is um it's not getting it's really not getting the, the visibility it should to your point it is it is so huge um and all of this really is it makes the it makes makes me feel that application security as as you know, particular protectors, if you will, of, of application security, we shouldn't just think of our applications, but it's a broad context. It's it's from the people and developers first, but it's everywhere in between from where we host it and serve it to the nodes that our clients use and backwards. So I, I really appreciate your talk. I think this was fantastic and Thank you. great job. We're actually out of time. <laughs> So, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Uh, you can post other questions if you have it, even though Paul hasn't had a chance to answer them. Um, and we'll try to get those uh, to him. So uh, thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in the next talk. Cheers, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.